Warning, the following video is about a guy who lived in the 20th century. It features ideas and issues that are largely still relevant today. If politics make you uncomfortable, you are prone to starting flame wars in the comments, or you're a resident of the PRC. <laughs> oh, that's right. China doesn't have a YouTube. I can talk all the trash I want. Welcome to the Eastern Hemisphere. Wait, Paris? Denmark? What are you doing here? Welcome to the Far East. Ah, feels good to step out of Europe. Once again, I get to put my education to good use. I knew there was a reason I took that class. Right then. I'm slightly congested, and this is Mao Zedong. He's known for a couple of things. On the one hand, he was kind of the only person to succeed in strengthening China so it could compete with other global powers. Lots of other people had tried, and while you could argue that whole century of failed attempts made it easier for him, he had to fight against a lot of that history in order to get China to do what he wanted. On the other hand, he was responsible for the deaths of millions and 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 millions, and millions of people. Mao's story begins, as far as I'm concerned, in the not-so-roaring twenties with the founding of China's Communist Party. Mao wasn't the one who started this party and wasn't yet the chairperson, he was just along for the ride, so we're gonna go through this as quickly as we can. The Chinese commies figured they'd do things the Russian Marxist way, get the workers to rebel in the cities, and maybe break a few eggs along the way. Then, Lenin pointed out that China was a one-party system that they could all just infiltrate, so they did things peacefully for a while, then the nationalists, aka Guomindang, yes I'm pronouncing it with a G, decided that the communists were a bigger threat than Japan, which, well... I guess they were the ones who ended up taking over China, and the civil war was in full force! Mao really gets rolling after the Long March, a communist exodus from Jiangxi to Shanxi through marshes, mountains, and rivers, which Mao did not part, even though he'd probably tell you he did. It took over a year from October 34 to October 35, so it really should have been called the Long October. 90% of those who started either died or defected, but those who made it were fiercely loyal and formed the base of the Mao Zedong fan club. At this point, Mao was out in the countryside, where there are very few factory workers to revolt with, so he had to get creative and use peasants as the source of his power. Not exactly Marx's idea of a proletariat, but it would What's that? Japan's invading! Better go defend- No, go deal with the communists, said Chiang Kai-shek. No, said Zhang shui -liang. So he kidnapped him and made the nationalists and the communists play nice. Turns out Mao was really good at making people like him. He'd already been using land reform, some peaceful, some not so peaceful, to win the favor of the local peasants, and now that the communist party was technically allies with the official government and fighting against the Japanese who had done some not so nice things in Nanking, his popularity skyrocketed tenfold! But before the war with Japan was over, the Second United Front fizzled away, and once again... The US sent some boys over to make the Kuomintang and People's Liberation Front play nice again in what is commonly referred to as the Dixie Mission, but they would have none of it. Trouble was, the communists had better organization, more spirit, and less corruption than the Kuomintang, and by the 50s were able to drive them to Taiwan, where they remain to this day, and strap a yoke onto Tibetan Xinjiang, who had been de facto independent since, like, the Qing collapse. And thus, China became enveloped by the commies. This is the point in the video where we say goodbye to free-spirited, get stuff done, break a few eggs Mao, and say hello to smash the henhouse Mao. To establish his classless society, he he labeled everyone according to their social class, and if you were a landlord or a rich peasant, boy, had the tables turned on you. It became custom for every village to pick a landlord or three and publicly execute them, then pick a handful more and send them to re-education labor camps known as Lao Gai, which is where we get the name for that Lao Gai. He also initiated the Hundred Flowers Campaign, where, like blooming flowers, people from across the country could open up and share their opinions on the government. And so a few people came out with criticism, and then a lot of people came out with criticism, and then Mao killed them all. But this is tuppence compared to the Great Leap forward. A few years after the PRC was born, the government launched its first five-year plan. The goal was to further socialize the country and increase production, and China ended up producing more of pretty much everything than expected. Things were kind of looking up for China, I mean, after getting kicked around by Japan only a few years earlier, it was able to drive the US to a standstill in Korea after MacArthur said, what's that? Stop at the narrow neck? Sorry, uh, I can't hear you, uh, this side of the yalu is really noisy. But then, great chairman Mao, in his infinite wisdom, came up with an idea to make China even more productive and improve every area of the economy at once. What if everyone worked really, really hard? Peng Dehuai, an important dude in the capital P party, reminded Mao that the previous five-year plan had used conservative estimates and people were already enthusiastically over-reporting how much they actually made, and then he got fired. Turns out, asking people to just work harder and turn all their cooking utensils into worthless scrap iron in their backyards isn't the best way to run a country. Who knew? People continued to say, oh yes, Chairman Mao, we're making so much food, when actually they weren't, and like 30-some million people died of starvation? Honestly, it's hard to keep track at that point. After that little mishap, the rest of the Communist Party tried to put Mao in the back seat. Yeah, he was not happy with that. He took advantage of some angry students in Beijing, got the whole country in a stir about rightists and revisionists, and told the Chinese people to bombard the headquarters. Even though he was the government, he still found a way to revolt against the government. The following is a brief summation of the Cultural Revolution. 
Let's see, what did I miss? Well, China and the USSR didn't get along too well, but Mao wasn't too worried about conflict with a nuclear power because he believed in the power of the Zerg Rush. There was his right-hand man who he killed, his right-hand man who he probably killed, and his right-hand man who died of natural causes, so he killed everyone who mourned him. Finally, on his deathbed, Mao said, Don't give the country to Deng Xiaoping, he's going to make it capitalist. E er, and then the country was given to Deng Xiaoping, who made the country capitalist -er. Yes, the attentive viewer will know that I lied about the Clinton joke from last time. It just didn't fit in my narrative. So here goes. Who did cats vote for in November? Hillary Kitten. Ha ha ha! I should stop making promises.